in some ways our future selves are totally dependent on the things that we're doing now, right? So, you know, they're either sort of benefit from these decisions or, you know, the way you said it, destroyed <laughs> by our current actions. Okay, Hal, welcome to the show. Now, you've just read a great book called uh, Your Future Self. What would you say your central aim in writing this book was? Yeah, hey, now, thanks for having me, by the way. It's, it's great to talk to you again. Um, yeah, my central aim is to really um, get some of these big ideas out there. You know, a lot of the work that I've done has sort of been in the you know academic space and try to get some of these ideas out there in a way to help people close the gap between the you know, the intentions that they have, and then the actions that they take. Um, and so, you know, my, my my sort of central aim is that the book sort of helps explain why we sometimes have a hard time <laughs> making long term decisions that we're satisfied with, and maybe how to do better. Interesting. And one of the things you talk about in the book is that this, this capacity to think about the future and mentally travel through time, this actually might be like the defining feature of being a human being. Could you maybe tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, that one of the things I talk about in the book is this, you know, idea of me mental time travel. Mm. Um, and, you know, that sounds, uh, <laughs> it sounds almost like it's something from a sci-fi novel, but, you know, the, the basic idea is that anytime we sort of, you know, think ahead to the future or think back on the past or even think ahead to the future and think about how we'll think back on the past, you know, that that's all examples of mental time travel. And when when I write that this may be a defining feature of being human, part of what I'm talking about there is that while there may be other species that can engage in a little bit of mental time travel, I think humans have a really unique ability to do this in a totally sophisticated way. And they can do it um, easily and effortlessly. And in a way, the machinery involved in being able to travel ahead to the future and travel back on the past is the machinery that we can use to do better when it comes to decision making. <laughs> but we sometimes get so anchored in by the present that it can be really hard to actually do the types of mental time travel that we need to do in order to have more satisfying decisions. It's I think it's almost it's it's pivotal to the human experience because not only does it enable us to plan for the future and to, you know, make the future better, better than it is today. But it also is the root of a lot of our suffering too. It's the root of, you know, anxiety about the future, regret about the past. A lot of suffering is in this, this capacity. You know, I never thought about it until I read your book, but that, that does seem to make sense. It's such an interesting perspective that you bring there because um, you, you're absolutely right. I can't disagree with you. Um, it, you know, if if we it's it's almost as if there's a version of mental time travel that's productive and effective and efficient and if we think about the future and plan for it that can be um you know quite useful and then there's a version that that sort of um devolves into rumination right mm -hmm. and uh anxiety right rumination i guess would be about the past and anxiety would be about the future and this is when we're sort of circling around <laughs> without without actually doing something right um i i say this knowing that i'm you know completely guilty of it right but it you know i love i love your perspective there that it's the same machinery that could be used uh in sort of helpful ways is also the <laughs> is also what can sort of be you know our downfall uh of sorts for sure no for somebody that's listening to this, they might be a bit skeptical and, you know, like, what's the point in this? Like, why, why should I learn about my future self? Why should I even bother developing a connection to my future self? What would you say to that person? Oh, wow. That's great. Um, well, you know, I think, I think I would start by maybe pushing back and saying, you know, have you ever had a decision that you weren't completely satisfied with, you know, or have you ever felt like you had a hard time doing the things that you wanted to do, you know, whether that's sort of on the, <laughs> the basic example would be, you know, exercising more, spending less, but then there's other sort of deeper examples of, you know, how do I spend my time? How do I treat the other people around me? In other words, have you ever had a problem where there's a consequence now and there's a consequence later? If, if your answer to that is no, <laughs> then Okay, then your skepticism is warranted. 
But if if there's any tension in those sorts of decisions, then I would say getting to better understand our future selves and figure out the people that we will become and how we want those people to look back on now, I would say then that's going to be a useful exercise to try to combat some of the problems that we have now. Yeah, and it seems a central benefit of of doing this kind of work is that when we have a stronger emotional connection to our future self it improves our decision making in the present in the sense that we are more likely to make i don't want to say sacrifices because it's got a really negative connotation but make decisions in the present that are going to benefit that person so that means that whenever we do arrive at that future self which we will we'll never actually arrive at but whenever we do right. get there um they're in a better position and they're not being de being destroyed by our current actions yeah i think that's exactly right um you you bring up a couple things there. You know, the first is that in some ways our future selves are totally dependent on the things that we're doing now, right? So, you know, they're either sort of benefit from these decisions or, you know, the way you said it, destroyed <laughs> by our current actions. Um, and I think, you know, this is, this is really an important concept because then it comes back to this idea of you know present day you know we'll put quotes around it sacrifices because it doesn't always have to be a sacrifice right there could be decisions i make right now that do benefit my future self and they also benefit me right now um and so you know i think the recognition of those tensions um and the recognition that there's these sort of you know uh, constant back and forth between the the person i am now and the person i one day become um, that recognition, I, I think, like you said, could could change our likelihood to engage in some of these quote unquote sacrifices, or could also help us reframe those sacrifices to be something less <laughs> than a sacrifice per se. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I I think there's you know if we're trying to we're talking about a, a tension between the future self and the present self. I think there's a place in every day for both of these selves to come to the surface. And I think for me, like the early on in the day, like the mornings and stuff, like that's when I'm sort of future self mode. And then in the yeah. evenings, that's when like present self and there's space for both of them, you know? Yep. There, de there definitely is. Um, <laughs> I have the same, you know, I have the exact same experience as you, of course. I think many others do as well, but I like what you're saying. There's space for both of them, you know, that, um, well, let me ask you, what do you mean by that? When you say that there's space for both of them, like on a, do you mean that on a daily level or are you saying that on more of a, like, like macro level over time? I was meaning it on a, on a daily level, but we, mm. it could also apply to the macro. And a, a thing that jumped to mind for me whenever I was preparing for this was a quote by Alan Watts. It's like, mm. there's no point in, there's no point in making plans for the future if you, you don't have the ability to, um, enjoy the present you know so there's this sort of tension between planning for the future and actually being into it. because whenever you arrive at the future you're just going to be like thinking about the future as opposed to actually enjoying getting there if that makes sense no it makes total sense uh and i mean uh i like hearing you say it uh and 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 you know of course if we were to have alan watts say it but but like pump in some like electronic music in the background which i think is common now you know to to sort of sample him over that um it would be even cooler um but of course you know i think you know i take the meaning of that quote and what you're saying um to really reflect about something that researchers call hyperopia hyperopia okay. is when well let me back up myopia is when we are so focused on the present that we miss the future hmm. Hyperopia is when we're so focused on the future that we miss the present. Mm. And, you know, both opias, <laughs> both of them hurt our future selves, right? The The case of myopia is, is obvious, but when we're hyperopic, when we're so focused on the future that we miss the present, part of what we're doing is depriving our future selves of memories, and possibly creating a future self that looks back and wonders, where did the time go? <laughs> what did I do? Sure. Right. And sure. so there is, there is a world in which we can be future focused and plan for the future, but also present <laughs> in the present. Right. And, and, you know, able to be 
you know, dialed into what's happening right now around us and not sort of ruminating. I mean, this is what, you know, to go back to what you were saying earlier or, or anxious about the future, right? And so in that way, yeah, I totally agree with you that there's space for both uh, the present and future self. For sure. And I've heard other people say, and I this definitely would align with my experience, that moving towards a meaningful future provides the optimal experience of the present. You know, that's for me is what that that makes it so easy to be present throughout the day. Does that make sense? Yeah. It makes perfect sense to me. I mean, my my read on that is if you're moving toward an optimal future in a way, you don't have to be anxiously sort of spinning around about it and missing out on what's happening right in front of you. Is that sure. the way for that sure. you think about it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I like that a lot. No, in the book, I, th I find this really interesting is you, you tell the story of uh, being in, was it Iceland? I don't know. Yeah. You were at the Blue Lagoon and you're talking about um, the work of Laurie Paul and the vampire yeah. problem. And to me, this is like, I think this is so central just about making decisions and ones that are potentially irreversible. So can you tell us about the vampire problem and the work of Laurie Paul? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, you know, the, the story there, by the way, is I was, by the, this is not my normal thing, but I got invited to go to a conference in, in Iceland and it was at the Blue Lagoon Spa, which, you know, by the way, uh, what, a, is there a better spot for a, <laughs> a conference? Um, and it was all researchers who study time, you know, in the, its various forms. Um, and Lori Paul, she's a philosophy professor at Yale now, and she got up there and, you know, you, just to set the scene, like most academic talks are not uh, riveting. <laughs> so, you know, I'm sitting in this room, I'm in this conference room wondering, you know, was this the best move? Because everybody else is outside enjoying the Blue Lagoon and I'm in this little conference room, you know? And so, um, but she gets up there and she says, imagine you have a one-time only opportunity to become a vampire. <laughs> and I was like, all right, you know what? I'm dialed in now. And she basically goes on to say, okay, um, all your friends tell you that, uh, you know, becoming a vampire is great. They love it. It's so meaningful. It's changed their lives. And they say, you, you, Niall, will love it too, because we think that you have all the sort of characteristics that would make for a great vampire. You like to wear black clothes. You like to stay up late at night. You like trying exotic foods, right? Um, uh, so, so become a vampire. But there's one catch, and you mentioned it, which is that it's irreversible. That once you become a vampire, you can't undo that decision. And what's really interesting about this is that it's not only that the decision is irreversible, it's that we can't fully know, and this is Paul's point, we can't fully know what our future selves will value and prefer and experience until we become that new person, until we become the vampire, because we can't fully know how becoming a vampire will change us. Um, and, you know, by the, by the way, she's talking about this and I'm sitting in the back of the room sort of thinking, is she, you know, obviously this is a metaphor for something. And, and like days before my wife um, uh, became pregnant, like we, you know, got the little positive pregnancy test. And I'm sitting there thinking like, oh man, she's, she's got to be talking about becoming a parent. Like uh, everyone's telling me it's great and it's meaningful and it's crazy and you're up all night <laughs> and, 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 but you don't know what it's like until you become a parent. And, you know, around that moment of my own anxiety spiral, she says, you know, of course, this is all about becoming a parent, but it's really not just that it's about any big transition, whether we're moving cities or changing careers or um, getting married or divorced or any of these things that change our lives in a way that we can't anticipate until we go through the change. Um, I, I think it's one of the most profound ideas in modern philosophy because it really, it really puts a, it really sort of nicely, uh, um, you know, puts a point on how difficult it is to make plans for our future selves when we can't fully know them. Definitely, definitely. And 
as you're speaking there, it reminds me of Daniel Gilbert's TED Talk. Um, I think it's called The Psychology of Your Future Self, but he has yeah. this idea of the end of history illusion. And right. the, in a sentence, it's that human beings are works in progress that mistakenly think they're finished. Yeah. And what yeah. what what you've shared there and um uh, Gilbert's work, to me it's it's quite freeing to think that, you know, the person I'll be in 10 years has a whole different set of desires, values, et cetera, than what I'll have now, because then that can free me to go, okay, if that person is that different, then I can actually take decisions today to change because I know that, that person will have all these different, these different preferences, but they'll still be happy or they'll still be relatively happy, you know, because it, it can free people to get out of a, maybe a way of life that they might not necessarily be happy in. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense to me. And I think, I, I don't know, when I hear you say this, part of what I'm thinking is that it's, well, I think there's two ways to approach this sort of idea, this end of history illusion, uh, and this sort of concept, the vampire problem, which is, you know, on the one hand, to, to approach it with sort of fear, <laughs> like, I can't know, uh, you know, the future is already uncertain, and now it's almost even more uncertain. And then on the other hand, I think it's, I'll spit back to you what I think you're saying, I think it's freeing and liberating to say, I don't have to be baked. Like I am a work in progress and I might change. I might change between now and the future. I mean, I will, right? I've changed so much from the past to the to the present. Um, but it's it's anxiety provoking to to sort of state that because you know, we 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 sort of want to think, okay, everything's stable now, it's good. <laughs> and you know, I, but I think if you look at it the other way. Right. That's what you're saying. Right. If you look at it the other way, it's liberating. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so there was something I was going to ask you that was really top of mind and I completely forgot what it was. Maybe it'll come back to me in a minute, but, uh, you also talk or not, it was, it was really around, uh, what, how this, this is, can be quite anxiety provoking. Um, this, this vampire problem. Um, yeah. you know, because you don't know what's on the other side. Have you any like ways around this? Like have you you must have thought about ways where you can sort of maybe mitigate the anxiety. And in your case, for example, like you you didn't know what it was going to be like to be a parent. Obviously yeah. it, it already happened, but some people get around that by like getting a dog, for example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a couple of things, right? So you know, there's always that like you know, I always joke with my um my MBA and PhD students who are in their late 20s, you know, and they say, Oh, I've moved in with my partner and then I got a dog. And it's like, all right, I think we, you know, I think we all know what's next here, right? <laughs> um uh and I'm obviously being a little bit uh you know conventional in saying that. But part of part of I think what you're talking about is it's almost like practice, right? Like practicing something. And you know, obviously the experience of getting a dog or a cat or whatever it is is not remotely the same as being a parent but um it's it's at least a step in that direction you know there's another there's another thing that i think is actually suggested by work other other work by dan gilbert and his colleagues um which you know the, the, it's a paper called the power of neighborly advice and the the basic idea is that if we want to know what a future state of the world is like the best thing we could do is to ask somebody who's gone through that future state of the world. Um, and, and we balk at this idea because we want to think that we're unique. Like I, you know, <laughs> I mean, how many of us have, you know, almost put on the earmuffs when we ask our parents about their lives and they give us advice. We say, well, that's you, that's not me. Right. Um, mm. um, we, we want to think that we're somehow different from the generations that have come before us. But the reality is that, you know, averages are, Averages are pretty good. <laughs> They're not perfect. And what I mean by that is that, you know, on average, somebody who's gone through the experience I'm going through, or multiple people have gone through the experience that I'm going to go through, may have something to say to me about it. Um, you know, I think the value of that neighborly advice increases if we are receptive to to it, you know. And and I I let me let me just like make this more concrete or or rather let me like draw another analogy which is that i think most people under a certain age totally trust the netflix algorithm and the spotify algorithm and any of the algorithms that make recommendations to us and 
you know, if you think about it, all of those algorithms, all those recommendation engines, all they're doing is saying, there's a bunch of people just like you who've watched all the same movies that you have, but they've also watched these other ones that you haven't. So we're going to suggest those to you. And we say, I'll watch it. <laughs> mm-hmm. But if they had for said, sure. you know, you're a lot like other people, here's something just for you, just like these other people, we say, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty unique, you know? Um, so if we don't, if we don't balk at the suggestions that derive from algorithms in that context, you know, maybe we should be a little bit more open to the idea of, of getting suggestions about how life might look as a certain future self um, from others who have gone through the same things that we might go through. That makes a ton of sense. And I think in his book, uh, what's it called again? Whose book? Oh, it's the, a Gil, Gilbert's. It's like stumbling, oh, stumbling upon, upon happiness. happiness. Stumbling upon happiness. I think he talks about whenever you're doing that, it's vital that you ask people that are currently in the thick of it. You don't ask people that have maybe been doing something and then retired. Like say I was interested in a job. Like if I ask someone that's retired from it, they might be nostalgic about it. Whereas if they're in the midst of it, they know the day-to-day of it, you know? No, this is exactly right because you know memory. Ob- <laughs> this is no no surprise to any of your listeners when memory is fallible. But it's not just that it's fallible; it's that the negative fades faster, right? And so we tend to retain the positive, and the negative kind of gets like smoothed out, mm. and that will change these experiences, right? I mean, and like we know this anecdotally from parenting, right? It's like in the midst of the first kid, you're like, "I'll never do this again," and then somehow, <laughs> a couple of years later, you're like, "That wasn't so bad." Um, maybe we should try again. And so, you know, I think your point's very well taken, which is that if we're going to go down this path of getting advice from people who've gone through the thing we're thinking of going through, um, their advice would be more useful if it's happening while they're in it. Um, for sure. And I think that's, I think that's a really good, really good point. For sure. In the book, you um, do this, it's like a birthday thought experiment where you imagine if, a current birthday and a, a birthday maybe a few decades down the line. And there's a big difference here. Can you tell us about that and what happens when we start to zoom out from a future self? Yeah. So I'm curious if you've had this experience, but um, so this, this is actually based on research from Emily Pronin, who's a psychologist at Princeton. And she, you know, she's asked people to think about an experience now called a birthday right now, write down what that looks like the narrative of having a birthday right now and it's you know it's for for you and me i'm sure it's the same stuff right it's like you know there's some drinks and there's maybe cake and there's some friends and you know a a card or present or whatever and then she'll ask people to do this same exercise but for the very distant future and what what she has found is that there is a shift such that people are considerably more likely to use the third person perspective when thinking about the experience in the very distant future. In other words, if I was describing my birthday right now, I would say, I-, I probably have some cake and I'll probably have some friends in front of me. And I see, I see a, 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 an old fashioned standing, sitting right there. Mm. And if I'm going to do it for the very distant future, I say, all right, okay. I see he's, he's in the scene. He's, talking to his friends you know and he's uh gonna open up some presents now it, it sounds a little bit funny to like use the third person perspective but the it's not that everybody does this but that more people did it more people use the third person perspective and there's other research that has found similar similar findings um to that um but the point here is that our future selves can look like can look like other people and in, in our mind's eye and i i find that i find that fascinating to me, to me, that's extremely significant. You know, the the fact that in our mind's eye, we quite literally see um, our future self as a different person, almost as a straight a stranger from a third person perspective. And there's been there's been fMRI scans and everything that yeah. have shown that there's actually different activity in the brain. Can you tell us about that there as well? Yeah, and that, that's some of the you know some of my early work we. We were really curious, you know, like what happens when people think about their future selves, even on a neural level. And I'll, I'll just say as background, you know, one of the things we know is that the brain, the brain has a different pattern of activity when I think about myself compared to when I think about you, right? Like you're a, you're another person. I'm, I'm me. This of course makes sense. 
you know, in our in our research, we had people go into the scanner, an MRI machine, and we used fMRI, which is I think everybody probably listening knows, but you know, it's functional MRI. So you're look, you're you're sort of essentially tracking blood flow as people have thoughts and feelings and uh, et cetera. Um, you know, what we had people do is make some judgments about themselves now and themselves in the future and another person now and another person in the future. And, you know, the, the big takeaway is that the brain activity that arose when people thought about their future selves looked more similar to the brain activity that arose when people thought about another person. So like on average, I should say on average, in the brain, the future self looked like another person. It's it's like, um, I think it's another data point that speaks to the same thing in those birthday, you know, the birthday example, right? Which is that the future self can on some level seem like another. For sure. I think in that study, I can't remember who the authors were, but the uh, the the activity when the people were thinking about their future self was the same as activity whenever they were thinking about Angela Merkel. That was the sort of comparison because she's a very <laughs> neutral political figure, you know. <laughs> That's fantastic. So you know when we when we did that research, George Bush was the um, the target other, and then we switched it around because we said ah, it's too controversial. We used. <laughs> Well, we used Matt Damon and Natalie Portman because this was a sample of, you know, uh, American, uh, like young adults, you know, so, but um, that's pretty funny. Angela Merkel, I love that. <laughs> and the, uh, I, I suppose the, the practical implication of this, Hal, is that yeah, not, not only do we see ourselves, our future selves differently, we treat our future selves differently as well. And Emily Pronin has done some important yeah. research in that area too. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, she she did this, she's done some great work and she did this um very clever study where she had uh she she went up, you know, she had research assistants go up to undergrads again at Princeton and um asked them, you know, would you drink she said, We're doing this experiment for science, it's on the concept of disgust, and we've created this disgusting liquid and it's, you know, soy sauce and ketchup and vinegar and syrup. I forget something like that. Right. And she said, basically, how much of this would you drink for the sake of science? And I think the average answer was one ounce. And then she says, okay, you know, what about your fellow Princeton classmates? The, you know, they all want science to evolve too. How much would you assign <laughs> to other people? And now, all of a sudden, for some reason, people say, well, I'll give them four ounces, right? So, you know, it's like, I'll only have an ounce. Like they, they can have four times as much. And then they say, and then Pronin and her colleagues say, well, how about by the end of the semester? Um, let's figure out how much you, your future self, is going to drink at the end of the semester or in some future period of time. Oh, me in the future? Also four ounces, right? And so, the you know, the funny thing there is that the the decisions for future selves mimics the decisions for current others in other words we're in some ways treating those future selves as if they are other people right and so like you said what's the practical implication the practical implication is that when we make these decisions that have trade-offs between now and later sometimes we are sort of falling prey to this you know i don't know if it's a mistake or not it can be where we forget that we may have similar feelings in the future as we do now and instead opt to treat those future selves as if they are other people and that that can that can result in us you know overspending and undersaving and you know uh, overeating <laughs> and not exercising but it also can mean that we really just prioritize the now over over later definitely definitely and so really the we could argue that the central issue here is that we treat our future selves as if they are strangers or d different people because we don't feel an emotional connection to them. So really what we're trying to do, and one of the things that your book helps people to do is sort of like strengthen this connection so that you sort of like have this sort of like you hold your future self in, in almost like a good regard. I don't know if that's fair to say or not. I'm sort of... No, I think it's, I think that's absolutely fair to say. I, I really like the way that you said it too. And I, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's one of the big points is that, you know, our future self if treated like a stranger, um, that's when we may end up making decisions that we later regret. 
but if we can befriend that future self, right? Or, you know, bring it closer to us now, that's when I think we end up making the decisions that um, that we'll be satisfied with, or, or, or at least give ourselves a better chance <laughs> of being satisfied. Does that resonate yeah. with you? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And something I've actually implemented since reading the book in my own life is this, you know, this letter writing. Yeah. Um, I, f I find that really powerful actually. Um, so could you maybe tell us about what, what this kind of practice might look like? You know, what, what should people do? What should they not do? What, what are your thoughts yeah. here? Well, I'll tell you. And then I want to hear, I, I'd love to hear a little bit about like what you put in it. I mean, the basic idea really quickly is to create a conversation between your current self and your future self. Mm -hmm. And what that means is I think everybody's probably heard of the concept of writing a letter, you know, like a, one of these time capsule letters, right. To our future selves, but then go a step further and write a letter back from that future self. Um, now, is that what you did or did you just do the, the one to the future self? Well, in the book you talk about, it's important to do back and forth, you know, that's, yeah. that's going to get better results. So I've, I've done both and I find that really powerful. Yeah. What did you, what sort of things did you put in there? If, if you don't mind sharing. <laughs> At the start, it feels a bit weird. You know, it feels yeah. a bit like it's a bit weird to sort of get going. But once you're going, it flows quite well. When I'm writing to my future self, I think I'm writing, I'm sort of giving the context of my current situation, you know, where I'm at in life, what my hopes are for the future, where I see things going, like where would things go in an ideal world. And then when I'm doing the, the reverse, I'm sort of picturing like this sort of wise old version of me that's in a really good place in life. And he's just like, give me some like solid, solid wisdom. I kind of have a picture of him in my mind as well. And it's sort of, it's cool. getting a bit stronger over time, but yeah, that sort of back and forth. I find really. That's really cool. I love it. It's fun. That's nice. So, so in terms of best practices from your kind of research and what yeah. you, what you think yourself, what do you think is the best way to, to approach this? Yeah. You know, I mean, in some ways, I like to be a little agnostic because, um, you know, I think everybody has their sort of own inclination for how to handle this sort of like letter writing conversation. But the, the thing I would really recommend in terms of best practices are, you know, twofold. So one is um, I would take the exercise seriously. Like, I think if you want anything out of it, it, it is a little bit awkward. It's a little bit weird. But if you want anything out of it, you need to sort of de dedicate the space and time and, you know, mindset to doing it. And then, you know, the second thing is I would try to think really carefully about how you might feel in the future. Um, and, you know, think about things like, how am I spending my time in the future? And who am I spending it with? Um, I think, you know, in thinking ahead, it can be very easy to say surface level. Um, but if you can push past that and get deeper and, and think about, you know, what are my wants and desires? Like, what does an ideal like look like? Fully recognizing, by the way, that that may change um, and that you can only know so much. Um, that's okay. You know, I, 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 we, my wife and I just did this exercise where we said, well, you know what? Retirement for me is probably, you know, a couple decades away. I, I, I hope, you know, all, <laughs> all things going well. Um, and so we were having this conversation, you know, what would, re you know, what would an ideal retirement look like? And, it was, and, and I was struck by how difficult this was because I was saying, well, I think, I think we want to travel some, you know, I think, uh, I think I'm teaching a little bit. And it was like this funny question of like, what, what would it be like? But just the exercise of going through and asking, what are the preferences? Um, it was really, uh, emotionally engaging and it really made me think differently about, about the future. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so I know you've got to get going at half past all, so I want to respect your time. Uh, but it's been an absolute uh, delight to catch up with you again. And, you know, I really, really do recommend this book. Like on the one hand, you've got, there's loads of really like robust research in there, interesting science. There's loads of stories about some pretty interesting characters. You tell a story of, uh, I can't remember his name, a Brazilian yeah, like ser serial killer who like yeah. basically turns into a monk. And yeah. That sort of... <laughs> that's about the whole idea of like you know are we the same people across time yeah yeah but then there, there's also loads of practical like exercises and stuff you can do as well um so really, really recommend getting the book uh your future self where can people get that online where can people learn more about your research and your your work after this conversation 
Yeah, thanks, Niall. Um, HalHirschfield.com, that's got um, all the links, but, you know, the book's available anywhere you can buy books, you know, so, uh, but all the links are right there. And, um, and of course, you can, you know, find me on LinkedIn. And, um, you know, I also, uh, you know, do some speaking and whatnot as well. So if it, if it, if it's of interest, I'm happy to talk to people. So thanks for, thanks for doing this. It was, you know, it's so fun to chat with you again. It's an absolute pleasure, Hal. I wish you all the best. Take care and we'll talk soon. Thanks, Niall. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed the show. If you'd like to hear the full version, you can do so with the Weekend University Premium Membership. This gets you access to your mastered library of over five years of psychology conferences, including over 230 talks and interviews with the world's leading psychologists, professors and authors, unlimited CPD certification, transcripts, quizzes, premium passes for our annual conference, online courses with Richard Schwartz and Deb Dana, and more. The cost is £97 for one year, which breaks down at around 27p per day. The best bit is you can try it out for 30 days completely risk-free, as all orders come with a 100% money-back guarantee. If you're interested, please go to twumembers.com for more information.